Καλησπέρα from Athens. Καλησπέρα on the East Coast. Καλημέρα to the rest of the United States. I am Alexis Philaktopoulos, uh, president of CYA, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to uh, CYA's virtual lecture series, a forum of exchanging thoughts in a virtual environment and a podium in which people related to CYA and active in their fields uh, can share their expertise or experience with the broader public. This is our 18th lecture. And throughout this series of lectures that we began offering back in uh, June 2020, we have been very fortunate to have had speakers who are all experts and are affiliated with CYA in one way or another, either as board members or as, as trustee emeriti, uh, current and former faculty or alumni. And today is no different. In fact, today, our guest speaker encompasses all of which I just mentioned, holding literally all constituencies that are associated with our institution, making him an essential member of CYA, along with his being a distinguished expert in his professional field. Our speaker today is Jack Hermanson. Uh, Jack is an alumnus of CYA from the class of 1971. He has been part of CYA's governance and served as uh, 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 served on CYA's board of trustees uh, for eight years, stepping down from his position late last year. During his um, tenure, he has chaired the board's development committee and under his leadership and guidance, CYA's development and alumni relations offices became streamlined and started focusing on the culture of development as opposed to the culture of uh, fundraising, uh, the culture of development, which is a priority of creating relations with alumni. He is a loyal supporter uh, and significant contributor who truly loves CYA and cares for the well-being of the institution. And he is a friend of many of us, uh, from board members to staff and faculty, and obviously to many of you who are watching tonight, today. Uh, but Jack isn't only that. Professionally, he's much more. He is a respected authority in the specialized area of name recognition and considered an expert in this field. He has, he is the former CEO of Language Analysis Systems, LAS, a provider of knowledge-based multicultural name recognition solutions for commercial and government agencies. He is recognized on two US patents in the field and has published numerous papers concerning his work. Uh, Jack earned a PhD with distinction in computational linguistics and a minor in Chinese from Georgetown University. He earned two undergraduate degrees from Penn in linguistics and speech and attended college year in Athens for a full academic year academic year in 1771. Today, he will be giving us a talk on personal names and the history of automated name recognition, the focus of his career over 30 years, and the research of which has proven to be of great importance as it has ultimately made the world a safer place. Um, Jack will be joined virtually by our very own development officer, Billy, Billy Simopoulos, who will be making his debut, <laughs> debut his beginning anyway, as a moderator, uh, serving as uh, the discussant to today's lecture. Uh, Billy joined CYA in 
2018, and uh, he is doing fantastic work in uh, the in our in our development efforts. Um, and he's the man also behind the scenes for CYA's virtual lecture series. Although today he will be sharing center stage with us and not being the guy behind the, behind the curtains, so to speak. Uh, Billy earned his BA in communication from USC, University of Southern California and his ALM Master of Liberal Arts in Government from Harvard University. Both Billy and Jack have had uh, a very important relationship with CYA working together in CYA's development and therefore pairing them together was, was not so difficult. Uh, before I pass on the floor to Billy, let me just say again, remind everybody that this session is being recorded and the discussion will be saved for the future. So those of you who prefer not to be not to be uh, seen, recorded, whatever, should switch off their videos, their video cameras. Billy, uh, the, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Phil, and thank you all for joining us today for what will be a very informative and interesting lecture. Uh, uh, it's an absolute pleasure for me to facilitate uh, today's discussion uh, because uh, our guest speaker is a very important individual, not just for what he's accomplished in the field of his profession, but also uh, because of his devotion uh, to the well-being of CYA as an institution, as Mr. Phil uh, mentioned. Uh, but Jack is not only important to CYA, he's also important to me personally as he acted more as a, as a mentor than a committee chair when we were working uh, uh, together at CYS Development. Uh, Jack has motivated me to reach goals. Uh, he instilled a what gets measured is what gets done mentality and has been an excellent sounding board for ideas and processes when it comes to CYA uh, development. Uh, he along with Mr. Phil literally trained me for the job. Uh, today, Jack Hermanson, as Mr. Phil already mentioned, will talk about personal names and the history of automated name uh, recognition, a technology he first uh, developed in the 80s while working on his doctorate in computational linguistics at Georgetown University. Granted, I don't know much about the technology that Jack is going to be talking about, but what I do know is that this technology has been instrumental in law enforcement and that we are in for a very informative and eye-opening lecture uh, along with several of Jack's uh, personal anecdotes. So hopefully my queries after listening to, to Jack's lecture will echo, echo yours. Um, now, before turning to the lecture and ceding the floor to Jack, let me establish some Zoom housekeeping rules, which I'm sure you are all aware of and already know. So throughout the lecture, you may, you may use the chat feature on the bottom of, uh, of your Zoom screen for any questions that you might have. I'll collect those and, try and share as many as we can at the end when we have a Q&A session that follows uh, Jack's presentation. And also, as Mr. Phil uh, already mentioned, this lecture is being recorded and a link to the lecture will be sent to all of you uh, by Friday. So with that being said, I'm excited to get this lecture started. Jack, it's great to see you. And thanks for joining us from Catherine, in Virginia. The floor is yours. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. Thank you to Alexis and to Billy. Should I share the screen now? Okay, yes, let's. Yes. But someone once taught me when you do this, you don't tell anybody what's going to happen. You just say, watch this. Okay, share this screen, right? Is that what we're doing, Billy? Yep. It's, it's, All right. Yeah. And now, now I can run this. Mm -hmm. Down the bottom. With luck, there we go. There we go, great. Now I'd like to get rid of these uh, faces on my screen. All right, what's in a name, an automated name recognition? I told Billy a short anecdote that uh, I think is a good starter for this. Many of you know that my uh, sister and brother and I were born in Greece. My uh, father was there with the Marshall Plan and he told a story about um, 
uh, senators that would come to visit Greece. In the very beginning, it was quite brutal in 1947. But um, as um, Greece came back, uh, got back on its feet, a lot of American senators uh, wanted to come over and see Greece and um, talk to Greek people. One of them asked him that if he could give him some words in Greek that he could tell the audience at the conclusion of his speech. And he said, he said, I'll tell you, Senator, that Greek is a tough language. He said, why don't you just say thank you and that'd be enough. He said, really? He said, sure. He said, well, how do you say thank you? And he said, it's efharisto. And the Senator said, I beg your pardon? He said, efharisto, and he wrote it out for him. It didn't help him when he wrote it in Greek. So he said, just think of it as a man's name. F. Harry Stowe. If you finish up your speech, just look at the audience, say F. Harry Stowe. Everyone in that audience will hear thank you. Senator said, you're kidding me. But at the end of his speech, he tried it out, took a deep breath, looked over the crowd and boomed out over the crowd, Harry F. Stowe. Of course, no one in the audience knew what he'd said, but everybody jumped to their feet and with applause. So it looked like problems with name searching is something that uh, began early in my life. Let me see here. I want to tell you a little bit about what we're going to talk about. Um, this, for me, this all started in uh, 1984 when two men came into my office with suits on. I had a little tiny office at Georgetown. They said, are you Jack Hermanson? I said, yes. They said, are you a computational linguist? And I confessed I was. And they said, we don't know what that is, but we want to bid on a contract for the State Department and they require a computational linguist. And that, from that day on, it changed my life. We did worked on a requirements analysis and that's what I'm going to show you here and some of the developments that came out of it. And that's, um, what eventually became the new visa processing system for the State Department and also became um, used throughout the uh, community. So what is the problem with names? Let's start with Arabic names. I don't speak Arabic, I haven't studied it, but I know this slide well. Arabic's written, it's an alphabetic language. It reads from right to left. So here at the top, you'll see the title Hajj, Here's Muhammad, the name of the prophet. No vowels here, but the little vowelation, vowel dots are put in, in some places to help with pronunciation. This is Uthman Abd al-Rahib, one of the 99 names of God, Abd al-Rahib, servant of the merciful, something like that. We actually discovered there are 104 of the 99 names of God, but that seems to be um, the way it's characterized. Now this name written this way in Arabic is the same name, but look at how it's Romanized across the Arab um, Northern Africa from Hajj Muhammad Uthman Abdul Rakib, Usman Rakib, Imhamid Uthman. This is the way it appears in the, excuse me, in the, um, let me back up here. There we go. This is the way it appears in the passport in a Romanized form. And you can see why this was causing headaches for the um, State Department. Now we can move to Chinese. Things got considerably more complicated with Chinese names because it's not alphabetic. These uh, characters um, are logographs. Each one is independent itself. It's not constructed out of parts. Although you may find what are called radicals, little common pieces. But this name, Zhang Chu Su, is written at the top in pinyin in the current um, transcription system used for Chinese names in the um, People's Republic of China, Z-H-A-N-G. Taiwan, of course, doesn't do that. They use the Wei Giles system, C-H-A-N-G, which had been around since um, early 20th century. And of course, Thailand, Singapore, and Malaysia all have variant representations of this very same name because it's pronounced dramatically different depending on where you are. 
this gets really complicated because this one character, remember the Chang that we looked at in the previous slide, is um, Romanized in many different ways, depending also not only on the dialect, but who's doing the Romanization. So we see here Zhang, that's the pinyin romanization that's um, considered to be the, the correct way, if you will, in Chinese. Right underneath it, though, is a Dutch transcription and then a Russian transcription of it. And that's just the Mandarin dialect. When we go to Cantonese dialect, it's dramatically different. Mandarin has four tones that they use. So a, a, a word like Ma, M-A would be ma, 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 ma. And they're very different. Mother, marijuana, horse, and hemp. Horse and to curse. Ma, 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 ma. In Cantonese, there are 12 tones. I have no idea how that works, but it's considerably more complicated for a foreigner. So we see that um, some of these variations in the Mandarin form, I'll skip through the this is a great slide here that um, when we're working on the requirements analysis, uh, the only place to eat was a little Korean deli down on the first floor and we'd go there to eat. And after being in there dozens of times, I happened to notice that there was a phone book laying by the cash register, a Korean American phone book. And I opened it up and I said, oh my God, this is a gold mine. So I've worked with my uh, son on this. Um, he studied Korean in the Marine Corps. And let me point out to you here, this, what looks like a little man here, Korean is an alphabetic language. So this is constructed from letters in the alphabet. This little man, it's the same one all the way down on both sides of the page. And look at the different ways that the owner of this name chose to have it represented in the phone book. This is how he wants it to be. Um, Romanized, Ryu, Yu, Liu, and this is an interesting one, Lu, Jane, Y. And often you'll see some anglicization like this where people would like to have their name a little more um, uh, closer to an American name. The reason this is tricky here is because if you don't know where the name came from, you're not gonna be able to do a proper uh, analysis of what alternative forms of it. So you see with Li here in Chinese, we have just very small variation. You can write it L-I or L-E-E, -E, Romanize it, but it's going to be Li. In Korean, it might be pronounced Yi or Ri. So each of those variants gets different vowels associated with it. So it's absolutely critical that you understand the um, origin of the name before you begin to um, before you begin to uh, try to find variants. Now this slide, I uh, gave this talk uh, to a, a Chinese speaking audience of policemen at the first Sino-American uh, police uh, symposium that was organized by a friend of mine. He said, come along with me and do the slides. So I presented this um, slide, very similar slides. And at the end, one of the policemen jumped to his feet and started shouting at me. And I didn't know what he was saying, but later, uh, even the translator was uh, unable to interpret it for me in real time. But my friend said he was, he was furious. He said, Chinese do not have this kind of problem with names. He said, maybe the Taiwanese do. So I, it was another example of how personal people take this naming, uh, uh, how, personal names, how they, how they treat them and the, the reverence almost that some of them are given. When I mentioned this to a friend of mine, uh, we were both laughed because neither of us were talking about Chinese having difficulty with Chinese names. It's other people are having difficulty with Chinese names. So, he collected these names. He said, I'll give you an example for Chinese. Next time, show them this. Here's 11 different ways that Osama bin Laden's name is written in the newspaper. He said, these are tests that I found them in the newspaper written in Chinese. All these different forms of the same name, Laden, bin Laden, Osama bin Laden. So this is also a problem for Chinese people. 
So now that we know this is a big problem, it's been swept under the rug for a century. And I'll, I'll show you some of that history later, but we can't continue to ignore it. That was the problem I was pointing out back in the uh, uh, late 90s when Mir Amal Kanzi uh, got a, into the US with a visa and outside of CYA headquarters, some of you may remember this, he shot five people who were sitting in their cars. The reason that he was able to get in the country, who was tracked down and said he dropped the N from his name because it's not really in Urdu, it's not really a character, it's more an inflection, a nasalization. So Kanzi, Kazi, fine. But the fact that one letter was what it took is pretty dramatic. And that's why we have to do such a better, we have to improve the work on this. Here's a, a bank fraud that, um, um, how fraud was perpetrated. And there are a bunch of these with um, uh, terrorist suspects, uh, people who were confused with terrorist suspect, um, Bank Security Act violations, uh, Federal Deposit Insurance Corp found a lot of uh, problems with main, money laundering. And I wanna take a moment here to tell you that as this software developed and um, we focused on the um, law enforcement side of it. There were also companies who were very interested in it from the other side, from uh, being careful with people's names because they were their customers. Airlines were very interested in this. Um, we also, I was giving this very talk when I first joined IBM at a big uh, symposium in Barcelona. And um, after the talk, um, the salesman who'd been kind of taking me under his wing, he said, that was great talk, Jack. A lady that heard it said, um, she really thinks it'd be important to her company. So we're gonna go to London tomorrow. I said, Jim, I can't go to London. I got another conference. I go to Interpol. I've got a whole schedule laid out here. He said, Jack, we're going to London. This is one of IBM's biggest customers. He said, this bank pays IBM a million dollars a day. I said, really? So well, let's get tickets and we'll go. So we um, headed up there and uh, found out, uh, got in a little office with two guys. One was a vice president of security and the other was vice president of public relations. So I was giving the talk to the security officer because that was usually the people that are interested, but it wasn't long into the talk before he said, Jack, I don't know why you're focusing on me. This guy next to me has 10 times the budget I have, and he's the one that's really interested. So I focused to him and he explained the issue. He said, this is very confidential, he said, but in six months, we're gonna open a massive worldwide campaign. And the slogan for that campaign is, we are your neighborhood bank. He said, if we don't get these people's names right, they're not gonna believe us. So I like that that took off. That was quite a, an impressive thing. And I had to smile six months later as I was walking down the jetway to air, get on an airplane and said, HSBC, we are your neighborhood bank. So what are we gonna do to solve this problem? Well, first of all, to have successful name, name matching, you need an algorithm that moderates between a database and a user. You have a database of names, and this algorithm helps the user find the names that are useful to him. That's the only purpose of the search engine. So how do we find this? 30 years of R&D, a billion names representing every country in the world, and a three years classified investigation by IBIS, the problems of names helped develop this. People ask us, where did you get a billion names? And some asked, could we have those billion names? And of course, uh, they couldn't. But getting data was the biggest problem we had. We needed to have names from as many countries uh, in the world outside of the US. We're not interested in US names um, because they're protected. But um, people coming to get a visa, a non immigrant visa, their names are not protected. An immigrant visa, that is protected. 
But I talked to a fellow who worked for Customs Service and Immigration and Natural Naturalization Service and said, I could sure use a lot of those names. He said, I'll see what I can do. It took a while, months, but one day he showed up at the door of the office with two shopping bags filled with computer tapes, small 6340 cartridges, and they had over um, seven, 800,000 names. And what we did was uh, put them into uh, our system, divide them into given names and surnames by country. And that's how we got the, the critical mass of information we needed. What happens with database issues is that they're often put into the database in different formats. And this was a great example. We saw it everywhere. You'd have given name, Maria Elena, surname, Lopez Garza, because the field was too short, so the A got dropped. In the middle example, every name had a separate field. And in the last one, Lopez Garcia was combined to say, well, this whole thing is the last name. And there are many, many other variants on this that cause problems. The problem didn't arise in the database, we found. It, arise, it arises from the forms that people are given to fill out. Some of them would have a uh, family name, given name, middle initial, um, just name, last name, middle name, first name. Well, in most of the world, people don't have a last name, a middle name, and a first name. They just have a name. So it's difficult to, um, we wanted to standardize the data entry for this process. We also had tremendously ineffective search technology. Exact match was often used and it's uh, prone obviously to failure. Um, bear in mind, not just alterations of name, but errors in the database. Soundex was much touted system. Well, we have Soundex we're using. And it turned out Soundex uh, really was popular in 1918, but it was originally built in the 1890s um, to process the 1890 census data. And a variant of that was the New York State Identification Information System, 1963. And then there were many homegrown systems. Here's how Soundex worked and how poorly it worked. This is our friend Mire Malkanzi, the murderer. He got into the country because the Soundex code for his name, Kanzi, is K520. They take the first letter and then the rest of the consonants belong to uh, one of five, six um, categories. So when the N was dropped, that's a consonant that was dropped. So the code to look him up was K200. So obviously they didn't match. But this poor lady, this Staff Sergeant Green, her name Green has a G and then the R and the N, six, five, zero, because there are no more consonants. But that's exactly the same sound X code as a name like Garwami, because of the way that uh, H and W are, not, are treated as vowels. So you have R and M and has the same code. So you see the kind of problems we have with sound X. The other problem is that the Databases were so huge that they had to be partitioned and they were partitioned then by SoundX codes. And the problem with that is clear here that you wouldn't even look in the correct partition if you had a SoundX code that was similar. This was a huge problem for Chinese names because many Chinese and Oriental names only have uh, one consonant, all the Qi, Cho, Chai, Tsai, Li, Lu, Liao, Lao, those have just L and three zeros. So you, you get a wide range of results when you look at them. Now here's the, the vaunted Soundex system. This was used to process the 1980 census. Uh, I'm sorry, the 1890 census, as I mentioned. And it was developed by um, a guy named Hollerith. Hollerith later founded IBM, which is very interesting. Um, historical accident because it was with IBM that I ended up after working with this um, SoundX code. So we have these, these problems. We have a problem with the database. We have a problem with search. And then we have limited user support. Who could know all these things about these languages? Um, I know in Montreal, we went up there, they would have, a, they had multi-ethnic uh, um, 
people coming through. And in the visa office, you would hear people shouting, said, who knows anything about Laotian names? And somebody would come over and help them. And what do you know about Thai names? So we needed to have some kind of support for the user that said, here's what happens with these names, pay attention to this. So what came out of it? We built an uh, intelligent query system that helped the user make a smart query, understand where to break a name. Is this, uh, what kind of name is it? We had um, a global name scoring algorithm that determined what was similar in the database. And we had in the bottom right hand corner, global name analytics so that we could analyze the quality of the database as it grew and say, yes, this is, this is growing consistent with the partitioning we've seen before. It's not becoming um, uh, distorted by a certain dump of, of um, I don't know, Haitian names or something. But then once the results are returned, you have to have some way to help the user understand why is this a good match? This doesn't look like a good match to me. And I have some great examples later on to show you this. These were the three elements that we focused on then, the user, the search technology, and the data. Here is the first version of the, um, I'm just, sorry, this is the IBM version of the um, name reference library that's meant to help the uh, users. We had, my company LAS had a uh, different um, interface that you'll see, but it's basically the same technology. So when you type in a surname, it tells you what kind of name it is. It, um, you can look up in the um, cultures to the left to get more information about that culture. You can ask the system to explain, why do you think this is Arabic? Give me, how does this compare to other names? You can see that it separates out the um, titles and prefixes so you don't think that Hodge is somebody's name. And then it shows you the countries in frequency order where this name would appear most likely. This name spelled this way is most likely to be found in Bangladesh, then Indonesia, Saudi Arabia. So that's the, um, the way that the name reference library helps, helps people. So here's um, a real life example. On uh, one of these trips, I met an insurance agent, kind of like Johnny Dollar, if you remember, he used to look for um, people who uh, ran out on their insurance obligations. So he, he tracked insurance fraud. And one day he sent me a, a name and he said, all he said is, can you give me anything on this? Where should I start looking? So I'd never seen a name like this before in my life, but I did notice a couple things about it. This OE diphthong is very rare, especially in the, these kind of names. There's an Arabic name, obviously, Karim Box. They, so Karim Zainel Box. The OE is very common in Dutch transcription. So I said, aha, I, I think it's something to do with somewhere Dutch. And Karim is Islamic. So when you have Islamic and Dutch, where are you going to go look? Well, the largest Muslim country in the world, you probably know, is Indonesia. And Indonesia once was called the Dutch East Indies. So maybe there is still some Indonesian influence there. So I thought, well, that's pretty slick, Jack. I was very proud of myself. And I said, just to be sure, let me run it through the name reference library. Here is the name analysis that came back. It said, this is a Pakistani name, but it's most likely found in Suriname. Suriname. Notice that Indonesia doesn't even appear on this list, but the Netherlands is there, that, the, um, that OE diphthong, that was kind of interesting. But Suriname, you might remember, used to be called the Dutch East Indies. It used to be called Dutch Guyana. So, the analysis was correct, but I would have sent this guy searching halfway around the globe. So I was real happy when I was able to send him this and help him out. So that's all I've got. Thank you. And um, Billy, is there a way I unshare this now? Just, uh, yeah, uh, stop sharing. There's a, there should be an option saying.
stop share, but there you go. Pretty clear, isn't it? Yes. I mean, wow. I mean, uh, I, you never think that there's so much going on with regard to how each name can be I mean, spelled out in different ways that you know it originates from various parts of the country and then you can pinpoint various parts of the world and you can pinpoint on where where actually that person your name uh the person belongs to what country is from i mean it's 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 it it's also amazes me the fact that you know how you, you got names that are pronounced the same way but are written completely differently whether it's a chinese mandarin or 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 arabic in different areas of the middle east it's and it's just mind-boggling i mean i have no better way to to to, to, to express this but it's mind-boggling for everyone and that's why yeah. having some software is so critical yes but what i'm trying to get at is you need to actually know about these cultures how how do you I mean, how do you find the staff? I mean, how do you, it's just, how, how, big a, how big a team did you have in order to collect this, uh, collect all this information in order to create this database and that would evolve into what? We started time. out very small, four or five of us, but we had specialists in uh, Arabic names and in um, Russian names and certain uh, Hispanic names and then grew as we needed to. We eventually ended up with about 30, 35 people that were operating, working on this. And I, I did a lot of my trolling at Georgetown. The linguists, they were very good and I knew them. And I hired uh, one professor of phonology and he'd actually studied Hindi. So he knew a lot about Indian names, but he also uh, understood the, um, the intricacies of the, the alphabet to sound relationship. And I liked one day I walked into his office, he said, you're not gonna believe this, Jack, but I'm reading this book of Noam Chomsky's uh, phonology. And it's about four inches thick. And he said, I'm fascinated by it. So I'm reading this and I said, oh my gosh, I gotta put this down and get back to work. And then he said, he said I stopped and I thought, no, this is my work. <laughs> so their people were very excited about doing something that was interesting to them and finding these uh, magical moments. And, and magical moments being uh, at a cafeteria and turning your head and finding the uh, Korean English phone book. <laughs> they, there you go. You got yes. a treasure right there that you didn't realize was available. Um, you mentioned uh, that uh, your, your company, the, the Language Analysis Systems, and actually I've read about this also, that it was acquired by IBM in 2006. And there is where you were named the executive charged uh, with promulgating LAS as name recognition to IBM Labs and, and customers around the world. Uh, it is also known that LAS uh, helped track 9-11 terrorists. And I mean- Yes, uh, can you hear that story? Yes, I mean, I, I, yes, I would. I think a lot of people- would. Yes. I got a, a, a one line email and it just said in the subject line, it said name reference library and underneath it said, um, have you improved it? Are there any advancements? How soon can you get it here? And uh, there was nothing there, it says name reference library. And I looked at the, the email address and it ended in dot, uh, DOJ, Department of Justice. I knew that was an INS thing. So I had a friend at INS who was a big supporter of ours and took our software around the country we were going to go live with uh, immigration and naturalization in October of 2001. But of course, September of 2001 trumped everything. So she called me back and she said, uh, Jack, are you sitting down? I said, yeah, in fact, I'm in my car. She said, pull over. This guy got a, you gave him a CD of your um, uh, software, a demo copy of it. And he used it to track one of these terrorists to where he was in flight school in Florida. He said, he needs more, he wants more of this. So I was just overcome. It was an amazing moment that um, we'd heard a lot of stories, but most of the things that um, people do with this software, you never hear about. So this was one that was revealed in that way. And we, it was, it 
gave all of us a sense that we were trying to do something, helping somebody. And I, apparently at the time you had to keep that. At the time. Yeah, you, uh, you couldn't, you couldn't, you couldn't disclose any of this information that was going on, obviously, because of. Well, some of it, some of it we could not disclose that we could talk about because it was disclosed. It was, um, everybody was looking for them and slowly that would come out. But a lot of what we did was classified. And um, we'd be in a skiff, a compartmented information facility with lead walls because um, the software itself was not classified, but the names, everybody's database of names was extremely highly classified. Yeah, well, that's, that's quite a story. I mean, you're realizing that all this, I mean, obviously the research going up behind uh, the names and the fact that it's been, it's been used for, for, for Homeland Security, should I, should I say, it's, it's, it's crazy. Um, I got a question in the chat box, which I'll read to you uh, from Susan Spencer. Uh, is this system used throughout the world in passport control booths? Uh, passport officers often scan our passports before they let us through. I assume this is to compare our name to a terrorist list or other list? Yes, that's part of it. But this, uh, over the last uh, 20 years, um, things have gotten much more sophisticated from the uh, passport side too. And uh, name checking I'm sure is still done, um, but there are other biometrics that are used and other um, things in your passport that help identify you. All right, Do you, just as a follow-up to that question. Uh, uh, I mean, I don't know how, how much you've, how much the technology has evolved since uh, you last, uh, since you've retired, but um, you think artificial intelligence might have a, a say in terms of how uh, names are now identified or? You know, I got a question, a question like that uh, before about, you know, is this an expert system? And I said, no, it's not. It's a knowledge-based system. And the difference is this requires a human being involved in the loop to look at it and make decisions. It's, um, it's because sometimes the consequences are severe. You don't want to all of a sudden have the door slam on somebody because a machine decided uh, his name matched something. So the knowledge-based systems are different in that respect. They, uh, um, they require a, you know, a person. In the all right. Well, I got a comment from Mr. Rafael Moises. Uh, he mentions, yeah, he's, he mentions like until this evening, he, his expertise on names was that if it ends in Akis, it is from Crete, Inatos from Kefalonia, and Idis from Pontos. <laughs> you know, that's fantastic. One of the best books I got on Greek names was from the CIA. It was a lady who wrote it, and um, they collect this information. It doesn't mean it's um, uh, uh, deleterious in any way. It's an instruction. They have some of the best um, manuals on um, all kinds of topics so they can understand how cultures work. That's, that's true. Um, you mentioned, uh, well, it, well, it's, it's evident that uh, your name recognition technology, aside from identifying terror suspects in this case, has been, uh, and it's, it has been instrumental in, in discovering fraud and wrongdoing. But what other uses can, has your technology uh, been, I mean, how, let me rephrase, what are the uses of this technology beyond law enforcement? You mentioned HSBC and, and, yes. and the slogan. Are there, are there any other uses of the technology that you might want to share well, with us? Sure. Um, everybody um, has name search systems for their mailing lists, um, you know, the, all the major, uh, merchandisers, banks are very um, interested in it. Um, I also had a, a tremendously interesting uh, experience with the Mormon church. Uh, they um, were interested in our technology and uh, they wanted to talk to our lead technology guy. So he flew out to uh, Salt Lake City. And after a day or two, he said, Jack, they don't want to talk to me. They want to talk to you. So I said, okay. So I came out and I thought, Maybe this is going to be a huge sale. I don't know what's going on, but the um, it turned out they didn't want to buy our software or give us any money at all. They wanted our database of names, but we should give it to them because it was for a higher purpose. And as I understand it, that the Mormon church feels that if they have someone's name, 
they can save their soul. Now, I'm not sure if I got that exactly right, but it was even someone who's, who's passed away. So this was, um, as you can imagine, a very interesting discussion that we had. At one point, the, the chief technology guy said to me, this is probably the first time you've ever talked to a company with a 400 year business plan. I said, yes, that's true. <laughs> So we left uh, on good terms, uh, but uh, that we didn't have a business deal there. Was it, was it just because you just didn't want to deal with the Mormon church or was it? They, they wanted to get it for free. They wanted to have our data. We didn't give anybody our database because that's, uh, that's the, the crown jewels. And also it needs all the surrounding software to maintain it and, and query it. And it's not just a, uh, it's not like an encyclopedia that you can look up yeah, and I, I, obviously they would need support while yes. it's, it's not just giving a, a CD with a database and then they just go in there. There's, a tremendous, there's a tremendous amount of uh, uh, misunderstanding about names and name search technology. And it's kind of sad when you look online. I, I don't even have access to name reference library anymore. And I wish I did sometimes, but I think I'd probably just waste away my time searching names because it's so fascinating. But now on the internet, all you get are baby names. Here's what you should name your baby. Oh, that's, oh, um, let me remind everybody, if you have questions, please shoot those in the, in the chat box. Um, I have an interesting story of myself with regard to, to names. Uh, my name is, in Greek, my name is Vasilis Simopoulos. But if you go about writing it in Greek in the legal document, it's Vasilios Simopoulos. It's, so there's a difference. And being a Greek American and flying back to the States on my American passport, which is Vasilis Simopoulos, I have trouble booking tickets because if I fly with my American passport, I have to make sure I, it's named Vasilis. If I fly with my Greek passport, I have to have it as Vasilios. But in order for me to enter the States, I need to fly with, with an American passport. So it's kind of an issue uh, going back and forth when booking tickets. So, I mean, that, that's part of, part of what your, your, your technology is trying to also uh, uh, solve. Is that, is that yeah. right? Yes. I mean, names of uh, surnames or the last names that might be different, differently written. Well, there's only so much that the database and the search engine can do. There's also a process. People need to, um, you know, have people who are schooled in this at the borders and uh, working on these issues. Yeah, I, I bet they would need to have to be uh, trained in trying to find these names. Obviously, you have you would have alert names and names that would be on alert in general that might be written, like you said, uh, Muhammad, or what was the-, the, the We did not, we did but, not. Many, um, many uh, offices did, of course. They would mm -hmm. say this is um, uh, not only an extremely bad person, they would have codes for them, but they also had important political figures that you didn't want to screw up and <laughs> put the, the king's son through uh, some rigmarole. So those were specially treated also. So they had a separate code. And uh, so the names, you know, were useful in a number of different ways. Yeah, but that wasn't something that you actually, actually had to, to, to actually emphasize. That, that was all depending on... On, on the customer. The, what, on did the they customer. Want to do? what did they want to do? So the, uh, yeah. Well, Jack, I mean... Thank you uh, for for being so kind, candid with your with your life's work, uh, for a wonderful presentation, um, and for an elegant handling of my questions, should I say, and the questions being asked by the chat by the audience. Uh, with that being said, I uh, I want to thank our audience as well uh, for tuning in and participating in uh, the discussion. Uh, oh, before I close, I got one more question, a couple more questions because. They're coming in and I don't want to leave them out. Um, by Elizabeth Filiotti, uh, does your system understand the feminine and masculine surname endings? Fascinating well, to talk, yes. Yes, it depends on the usage again. Um, it's none of the, let's see, some of the systems are coded for gender and it depends, you know, if the, the State Department might have that and say this is a woman's name or this is a man's name. 
but um, uh, we don't determine that in the software. It's up to somebody else because we would not know in, um, say, in a um, some African dialect if there's. Uh, we didn't study the culture itself. We we're just looking for the the best candidate to match to say to the user, you may be interested in these, and here's why. So that um, and they might be interested for um, gender reasons. They might be interested for records. They might be interested for banks. Uh, is this a uh, high value customer? So but those are all things that the user adds on. Okay, but you, you got you guys offer all those those options, or don't you? It's just we show people how to do them, but the okay. um, it's it's kind of like um, when you buy a car. You know, there's a guy come and teach you how to drive it. You no, know, you you say here's how I drive. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so here's a hammer. We don't care what you do with it. So. All right. Well, and uh, Ms. Daphne Hadzopoulos also, uh, she's referencing the same issue that uh, it, it, her last name is Hadzopoulos, but in Latin characters, it's C-H. Uh, and she's almost, she, she mentions that she yes. almost missed a flight because she's reservated her reservation with C-H instead of H Hadzopoulos. So, but well, thank you, Jack, very much. Uh, and thank you, to the audience for, for, for their questions and for, for participating. Uh, I'm now gonna pass on uh, things back to Mr. Philoctopoulos for some concluding remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Billy. Muted, I'm new, I was muted. Uh, thank you, Jack. This was, this was fascinating. It, it, it's, uh, I mean, I knew you had told us about all this, but I never really understood the uh, uh, the fine detail that uh, you described today. It's fascinating. But, you know, Jack, I want to, uh, you know, the Greek saying, uh, if you don't praise your own house, the proof will fall on your head. Uh, so I want to ask you a loaded question. How much influence, if any, did CYA have in your developing this uh, this whole idea uh, in terms of linguistics, in terms of uh, fascination with languages, in terms of cultural, uh, intercultural uh, uh, competence? Uh, did we have anything to do with it? Of course. Of course, uh, but um, it was not direct um, because of uh, something that I studied in Greece. But uh, that international um, exposure would make this kind of thing interesting to anybody. Uh, and of course, um, studying uh, Greek names through uh, history and determining uh, how they were spelled in um, ancient Greek. And that was always fascinating to me. I was studying linguistics in undergraduate school, but I had no idea that it was um, would come to this. I wasn't so interested in, I wasn't involved in the names aspect of it. Well, I, I want to suggest that uh, we, we present this work, Jack, to the Greek authorities. Uh, I think it would be most useful. For, uh, we need to find now who is the right person to present it to. All Greek Americans or Greeks that lived in America, or whatever, uh, have huge problems with the names. What Billy uh, described earlier on, I have it 10 times more complicated. I have a birth certificate from New York. I was born in New York that says that I was born as Ulysses Alexander Kyriakopoulos, son of Kitty and Paris. None of these names exist in Greece. Mm -hmm. There's no Ulysses, no Alexander, no Paris, no Kitty. It's Odysseus, it's uh, Ekaterini, and Paraskevas. And Kyriakopoulos is written in a different way. You cannot imagine the kind of difficulties and problems I have because of that. <laughs> I can imagine. It's a, it's a nightmare. It's an incredible nightmare. Yes. You know, they... I need to deposit my birth certificate and they will not accept it. And I don't know where to go to find a solution with this. It's, it's a nightmare. I once went to the 
uh, Greek consulate in New York to at least be able to get a certificate that Ulysses Alexander Kyriakopoulos and Odysseus Kyriakopoulos is the same person. That, 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 that worked at some point, but it doesn't save the whole problem. And, 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 and now I cannot do many things in Greece because I cannot deposit my, my, my birth certificate. They don't accept this as my certificate. Now, uh, Billy has two passports. Do you also have two different passports? <laughs> I had two passports. Uh, I, I gave up my U.S. passport in 1988, uh, and and uh, and uh, but I'm still suffering tremendously. You know, mm -hmm. tremendously. Well, right. Having been born in Greece, I could have been a dual. I, I was born. I was born in New York. The opposite. Uh -huh. you know. Yeah, but I would have had to serve in the Greek army and the U.S. army, and I thought, of well, course, I yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I had that. That was an issue when I was. Okay. In the seventies, uh, you know, turning, uh, I was just lucky you not know, to be drafted in the U.S. I had, I finally, I, I served the Greek army. Well, I don't know where you can go to get this resolved. Is some diplomatic? Um, I don't know. Service. I really don't know. I'm, I'm in, a, I'm in a dead end. You're in limbo. Odysseus, uh, Ulysses, Alexander. Uh, whatever. Kiriakopoulos, Kiri son of Paris and Kitty. Yeah, son of Paris and Kitty is right. We all have, uh, we all have horror stories to say about our names. I'm sure. Some all may, Greeks. Some are all Greeks. Not, <laughs> I'm sure. Not as bad as uh, as uh, you as the other says. Uh, I have uh, a great fun, uh, you know, with the spelling of my name. As I was telling you, Jack, before we uh, started this session. Uh, there are four, five, six, seven different ways to write my surname uh, and my first name. So uh, this reminds me of a of a pop culture saying, uh, which I'm paraphrasing. You can say what you want about me, but make sure you spell my name right. <laughs> anyway, guys, this was an enjoyable evening. Um, Unless but once, I, I have to tell you, this is a good joke, wait. Once I arrived somewhere in the Midwest, I don't know if it was uh, Chicago or some other Cincinnati or something like this. And, and I have this fantastic story where the security officer knew enough to say, but of course, Ulysses, and Odysseus is the same person. <laughs> wow. I was so amazed. I almost, you know, <laughs> the guy was so educated to recognize that the two names were the same because the reservation was done under Ulysses and my passport had me as Odysseus. <laughs> <laughs> Public school education in uh, wherever that was is, is doing a good job. Apparently. The guy, the guy. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> anyway. Uh, it's uh, over the hour, and uh, I just want to thank everybody for their uh, attendance and uh, to say that uh, we will continue uh, with these uh, lectures and keep making them uh, interesting like this one. Uh, Billy will continue making them as interesting as this one. <laughs> it's his, uh, his labor of love. Anyway, thank you so much from Athens. Good night.